Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Story Darlings podcast. I'm Sandra. And I'm Tara. What are we talking about today, Tara? We are talking about A Court of Mist and Fury, part two. Woohoo! If you're just hopping on, we are currently hosting a series read along for A Court of Thorns and Roses by Sarah J. Mass. So if you have not tuned into any other of our episodes or read the series, be sure to do that and check them out because this is going to be filled with spoilers. We just finished hosting a read along for the Throne of Glass series. So occasionally, some little out of context spoilery comments will come up out of that too. So just beware. But this episode is going to cover from chapters 33 onward to the rest of the book. So that is the second half of the book. And we're still in the summer court, right? They're trying to figure out the location of the Book of Breathings, which is what Reese has been training Feyre to do with her newly acquired magic skills. And you want to talk about some of these things that go on at the summer court? Well, A, Tarquin is a bit of a liberal as you like compare him to our world. Like he thinks that there is a place for high fae and the lower fae to like kind of be equal. So he is on Feyre and Reese's good side at that point because they are also liberals where they're, I mean, Feyre is even a step further where she thinks humans should be able to live with. Yes. The Fey Kingdom. And Tarquin and Summer Court is probably also on your and my good list too, because he is he is a dreamer like Feyre, and he is dreamy. And I don't know if you were picturing this because they describe his skin being darker and the lighter hair and eyes and stuff, but I was picturing the Valerians on uh, House of the Dragon. So like that kind of look to it. That's like what was stuck in my mind when I was thinking about the Summer Court. And Sandra does love the Valerians, especially <laughs> House of Dragons. What's his name? Matt Smith. Oh, no, I'm a huge fan of Daemon Targaryen. But the Valerian side, they're the ones black with like the white dreads and stuff. That oh, side okay. For the, okay. Yeah, for the spinoff series. But yes, mm-hmm. very much so. Every time Tarquin was like described or something, I was like, that's what I pictured. Okay. Yeah, no, um, that's not where my mind went, but <laughs> my mind went to like the Targaryens. Yes. This is not a Game of Thrones episode. This is a, a Court of Mist and Fury episode. Anyway, so they're at Summer Court. They're trying to find this book and there's a lot of jealousy going around. There's Tarquin's sister, Criseta is her mm-hmm. name, I believe. And so Resant is trying to play some distraction and deceive Kind of stuff and Feyre is just doing um little spy work trying to figure out where stuff is and want to go into more things that happen yeah so Tarquin hits on Feyre a little bit in that I think she says at first but she's like it'd be easy to fall in love with you and Reese is over here seething he's like what <laughs> no and then Tarquin says it back to her within Reese's hearing and so like there's some bickering between Feyre and Reese about oh it would be easy to fall in love with you yes <laughs> which is great and hilarious to me I I love that scene though because she was speaking from her heart to Tarquin she wasn't doing it to be you know deceptive or anything she was just like I think it would be very easy to love you and easier to be your friend and he says mm-hmm. the same exact thing back like Tara says and it's just this little moment like when I was first reading the series it's just like oh what if because you could totally see Feyre getting along with him too he seems like a romantic a dreamer he's working on these things he wants his court and his lands and people to have good things too and so I don't know it was a really touching moment well and in this moment she is feeling bad about her being there solely to still this part of this book that is entrusted to him and his family and so she's like "Eh, do I really want to do this like he probably would just give it to me if I explained but then there's a point where they figure out that he's not gonna give it to them even if they were to explain so she has to steal it and she feels bad about that. Yes. 
reading these couple chapters that were taking place in the summer court was a bit brutal because it's a constant stream of this internal dialogue. And she's just like, traitor, 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 liar, liar, liar. It's constantly how she sees herself. And you see her go on tours. So like Tarkman's showing her around the family heirlooms and all of the troves under the palace and all of this stuff. Um, and then she ends up just kind of being sad in her feelings because you know, here's Crusader sitting over on Rhysand's lap, and he's just like in her ear, just being his seductive, sexy, dark self. And she's just feeling like it's a very one sided thing. Like she's having these feelings for him, but he's just kind of playing a game with everyone. So she doesn't know what to think. But she does find the location when she's off, like just walking around, being in her feelings. There's a tidal causeway. And when the tide is low, this little building appears. and there, She's like, oh, definitely. And you see Feyre do things that seem kind of out of character for her to confirm that this is, in fact, where the Book of Breathings is because she does some mind control, right? Mm-hmm. Did you have any, like, feelings about when she's getting into Tarquin's head? Like, what you thought about that? Or how that went? Well, I think she is feeling out her own powers and kind of her sense of morality in, is this right? Is this wrong? But also, is it for the better good? Like, But as I said, she's feeling bad about this whole situation, but she's like, eh. but if you're not going to give it to me, we need it for the survival of everybody. So I'm going to take it. I almost felt bad for Tarquin because she kept saying, oh, if we just ask, he would hand over the book. And even when she's mind controlling him, his sense of like being very buttoned up about it is still like he still has a really strong hold over controlling himself there. And so they make this plan. And basically, Rizan leaves it up to the women, Amran and Feyre, to break into this place. And it's a cool scene because Feyre has been testing out her powers and playing with it. And you see her do all kinds of stuff. So you want to walk us through some of the things that happen when they're breaking into this and what like Rizan's role is and all of that. So Rizan, from my understanding, was supposed to be like a watch, like somebody watching out, right? And Amran and Feyre go in and Feyre, like the book is talking to her and being very creepy. And it's like, oh, who are you? And... It asks her what she is. Like, what are you? Mm -hmm. Which was also very creepy because we know that Pharaoh was made. So she's not really a fae. She's not really a human. But this book has this, like, sense that she's not either one, too. And it wants to know what she is. We see her shapeshift into Tarquin's form, which is so weird. And we've seen this before play out in the Sarah J. Mass universe, the massiverse, whatever you want to call it, right? It's just a really interesting scene how it goes down. And so we see kind of like, I don't know, I don't want I don't want to say it's funny because it turns out being kind of serious, but they get into the room with it. They get it's in a box. They don't know what the book looks like. It's in a box. But as soon as they touch the box, it's like an alarm goes off and they are locked in this room and the water starts rising. And what happens? And so they are almost drowning. So um, water is coming in. They're fighting tooth and nail. Amran is fighting tooth and nail, trying to hold the water at bay. And then the little sea wraiths come in and they save them. And they kind of just like throw them out and they're like, our sister's debt is paid. (laughs) So that seems kind of funny to me because they're like, just we're done with you. We don't like you. And Amron's like, what the fuck? Why did they help us? (laughs) And so is Reese, who comes in late, like a man, really, let's be honest. He's like, oh, what? What happened? And Amron's pissed and she's like, we almost died. Like, where were you? And... (laughs) And um, he's like, the sea race, like, most people wouldn't have helped them. And they probably would have been, like, more apt to just kill you than try and save you. And so Feyre told them, like, what she did. And they're like, well, that's weird that somebody was nice to a sea race. Mm -hmm. So we see that full circle come around with... um... Tamlin and his tithe collection whenever she showed the sister an ounce of kindness. 
So I that was really you. cool. Mm -hmm. I told mm -hmm. you it was coming back. Mm -hmm. Tara knows. <laughs> and so they get their hands on this book and they're winnowed back to the townhouse in Valaris and they are soaking wet, coughing up because it was a near drowning. Amran gets the book. And what do we find out about this book? Because they thought Pharaoh was going to be able to read it, which is why, you know, they had a keen interest in teaching her to read and all this stuff. And she was the one that was made. But the book is in an ancient language that only Amran knows how to read. Little aside here, because we read Throne of Glass. What's going through your mind? Well, like I said, I think Amran is some otherworldly, like, person right she's like a god or something from a different realm so i think that that might be something similar is they're reading words yeah don't we find out that amran is like ten thousand years old or something like some obscenely long amount of time and i don't know i kind of was like is the language on this book is it word marks like what is it and she mentions later in this part of the book that if they put the two halves together, like it will send out like a message to like people who have been slumbering for a long time. And we know Reese is really old. So these people have been like slumbering for thousands of years that are more powerful than the Fae. And so again, like are these gods that went to sleep after things happened, you know, maybe thousands and thousands of years ago 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 <laughs> we don't know will we find out so uh it becomes amran's job to try and decipher this tome and meanwhile a special delivery gets dropped off at the townhouse to amran rezand and Feyre. and what's that present <laughs> well amran gets two presents yeah, she has but, two. <laughs> but everybody else gets this blood ruby from the summer court, basically saying, like, you have a hit on your head because you stole from us. And Amran, because she made friends with Cressetta's brother or whatever. Varian. Varian. He sent her a necklace, too, because he's like, I really don't want to kill you. It's so interesting seeing that little dynamic play out too, right? Because Amran just strikes me as this super intimidating, powerful creature that is like beautiful, but very lethal. Obviously, everyone can feel that emanating from her. And then you have like this weird, like Varian character who doesn't know whether he wants to like go for it or not, because this could be the end of him. Um, it's yeah, it's it's kind of cute in a way. <laughs> Well, he has to make sure he doesn't, like, fuck around, because he will find out. <laughs> yes, he will. Um, um, the diamonds and, and ruby necklace, though, that was that was a nice touch. <laughs> yes. And then we find out some more backstories. We find out both Moore's backstory, which is, like, connected to another one. But basically, Moore's, like, parents wanted to sell her virginity off, right? And she she did not like that idea. And so when she was visiting Reese one time, she's like, oh, I'll just sleep with Cassian. And so she sleeps with Cassian. And so basically her parents are like, you're worthless. Like she she was she was betrothed to Lucian's oldest brother, Eris. And he sent back that now that she had been with this lowborn like Illyrian that she was worthless, like worth less than her, like a cow or something like that is what he yeah. said. And so he would not marry her. And so her parents beat the living shit out of her and threw her, I forgot where, like at Eris's like door or something. Autumn with court. like something like nailed, like a letter nailed into her hand. Saying she's your problem now. Yeah. Totally messed up. It reminded me of the Manon... Lysandra mm -hmm. kind of mix there for sure well, and then um Asriel and Cass Cassian I gave him a nickname um Cassian and Reese came and saved her and so that's why she feels so connected with all three of them and this didn't this also spark the big 
duke it out, brawl between Cassian and Asriel as well. Because Asriel, the poor guy, has like the biggest crush on more he is just fawning after her and Asriel's whole thing is he doesn't feel like he is worthy enough for anyone it's it's so sad he's one of my favorite boys like is it possible for all three of them to be your favorite because they are in very different ways but you just feel bad for him so yeah and then we hear a little bit more of the backstory of the war and I still have not lined this out in my head. So, Sandra, you're going to have to correct me. But Jurian was with Miriam at one point, right? Yes, it was Miriam. Miriam is who he cheated on Clithia, Amarantha's sister, with. Okay. And then he killed Clithia. Mm -hmm. And then Miriam ran off to be with Draken. Mm -hmm. And is still alive Mm -hmm. on a little island living with Draken that is like, I guess, warded, so nobody knows where it is. Mm-hmm. And they're just living their their best life. And more was a part of getting them there. And so Jurian, as we'll see later, does not like more and is wanting to know where she put Miriam. Yes, he has some unfinished business with Miriam. And I think all of this comes out when they meet with the mortal queens, right? Because mm-hmm. they're trying to gain the mortal queen's trust. The first time that they reached out to the queen's they decided not to meet with them at the estate with Nesta and Elena and everyone there. And so Reese has continued sending letters to them and all of this stuff. And so they required some kind of proof, really, of who Rezand is because he has a reputation for being Amarantha's, you know, call boy and doing all of her dirty work and stuff. So they feel that if he wants to work for the mortal queens that he needs to prove that he'll be on their side for sure. So Rhysand and crew, they have to go to the court of nightmares because more, you know, on this topic of more, more's family has this artifact called the Veritas orb. And it shows anyone who's in the room, the truth. And so Rhysand is basically like my only play at proving to the mortal queens that were on their side is to show them the big secret that I kept from Amarantha. I'm going to show them Valaris. I'm not going to take them to Valaris, but I will show them that it is a real place that exists. So we need to get the orb. So he holds court at the Court of Nightmares. Talk about this scene to me. <laughs> I just like that he apologizes to Feyre before they go in. He's like, I'm going to have to be somebody that I apologize for. And I didn't think he was that bad, like, <laughs> at all. <laughs> I, I mean, he was bad, be, but he like, was good. Evil. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and he wasn't. Yes, he he was stern with Moore's dad, but like, he deserves that shit. Right? So I was expecting it to be a lot worse based off of his apology. But basically, he treated Feyre like a call girl. Like, Get on my was, lap. <laughs> she was like forced on his lap and he was like, feeling her up the entire time and like making it a show for everybody else. Right. And so that's where he apologized for, like, I know, but like, she was just kind of like, I'm into this. So I just love the whole scene. Right. Because they're there like more and Amarin or, or no, Amarin didn't go. It was just more. And so more is like kind of mingling and Feyre's mingling and she's wearing like, it's basically like a, floor length loincloth front and back so you could like peek her front and back like through the sides like just big slits nothing very thin can see everything under it it's dark with like star kind of jewels on it very glamorous in a sexy way and so she's there and then Cassian and Asriel they come through the doors first and they're like marching toward you know the court of nightmares throne and they're just these big imposing illyrian warriors with all of their seven siphon siphons on each and then they're followed by rizan just kind of you know <clears throat> having his little walk hands in pockets down the aisle saunter. Uh, uh-huh his it's saunter. a saunter uh-huh. um <laughs> two things i want to mention before they got there somebody shot at them yes with arrows ash arrows that were like poisoned and so reese is already a little bit pissed off when he goes in because he's like what the hell how are they Mm -hmm. like tracking me and then two sandra mentioned that Cass 
and Asriel both have seven siphons. I held up the wrong number of fingers. <laughs> seven siphons. Um, whereas normal Illyrian warriors have one, and that's what's needed to control their killing like powers. Our boys are like the the strongest of the strong over here. So they are much feared as they walk in with their seven siphons. Yes. Plastered on their bodies. Like I I just imagining the scene of like, I don't know. I really love the walking away from the fire scenes in movies. <laughs> Was like, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can just imagine the scene as like them walking in, like, yeah, I know I'm bad shit, and then Reese coming in after, I'm like, yeah, I'll miss you, bitch. The bad boys are beloved for a reason, right? And it's like yes. kind of like this little dynamic. So Reese Hand comes in, he sits down, Favor's on his lap, touchy feely. This entire chapter had so much sexual tension, and I think that's why people love it so much. They're not doing anything bad, but his hand is like going up there. It gets very, very close to where (laughs) I'm like, how in depth do we get? And why am I giggling like a 12 year old or something like, ew, sexy stuff and erection (laughs) because he does. But um, yes. And so all of this to say is they're putting on this little spectacle of doing this in front of everybody because Moores is stealing the orb from under her father's nose. And meanwhile, her father's so disgusted by the behavior of Reese and Feyre because he's of the mindset that, you know, humans and mortals are just disgusting, like filth on the ground. And like, mm-hmm. why would, you know, he just doesn't like any of it. And so he makes a comment that he should have probably kept to himself. Again, this fuck around and find out. Well, he found out. And Reese basically snapped his hand, like snapped the bones in his hand and his like pinky and stuff. He pretzelized it. (laughs) Yeah. And told him that he wasn't allowed to heal it, like visit a healer. So like, he's like, if I hear that you did, then I'm going to break something else. Mm Mm-hmm. And you, you made the comment that it wasn't as like his behavior wasn't as bad as you thought it would be. The only thing that I can see is like, Feyre's Tamlin trauma was triggered, right? Because Tamlin is the one to use violence to protect Feyre, and that's very triggering for her. And so they end up having a fight about it after they visit the Court of Nightmares, and it becomes such a spat, like, they go days without talking to each other. (laughs) So, um... Reese is mad, right? Like... Uh-huh. Because she compares him to Tamlin or something like uh-huh. that, right? Like, and so don't he, do that. He gets, he gets mad and he leaves. And he goes and she's like writing him these little letters like, talk to me, talk to me. And he he's mad. He's big mad. And so he comes back just in time for a holiday, which we've seen before, which is Nassar. But it's a little bit different in Reese's kingdom. It's called Starfall in Reese's Kingdom because it's like this shooting like stars, but they're actual like little globes of people or something like. Yeah, spirits, I think. Yeah, ghosts. I was picturing like a meteor shower and shooting yeah. stars, like the craziest night sky you've ever seen. Just stunning. And then and then they splatted into Reese. And um, Thera, and so they each have little ghost, like I don't know. Again, with this, I'm picturing like Ghostbusters, where like the like big like gooey one like splats around. Big Ben, big Ben, big Ben, what happened? Are you okay? He's slimy. Yeah, so that's what I'm picturing, like the ooze. You think of those paint parties and stuff where people go Mm -hmm. with black lights and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I kept picturing too. The whole lore behind Starfall was a little weird. Like I didn't know where Sarah J. Mass was going with it because they talked about how it seems like year after year, there's less spirits, you know, going across to wherever they're headed. And so they find it um, kind of sad in a way, like still beautiful that they're still determined to get wherever they're going, but 
it's very mysterious, like what these spirits are. But yes, this whole magical little holiday celebration night is when Rhysand finally, you know, appears and decides to talk to Feyre again. And it ends up not being too shabby, right? Mm. They dance, they drink, they stargaze or spirit gaze, whatever you want to call it. And they talk a little bit about why he left and the fact that she compared him to Tamlin. He shares his trauma with Amarantha, making him do things for her on Starfall night longer than other nights, just because she knows how important it is to him. He does a lot of opening up. It's a very romantic scene. (laughs) And then they decide that they're going to leave Valaris um, to keep it safe because somebody is tracking them some way, right? And they're like trying to attack them. So they go to the training camps. <sighs> the Illyrian war camps. So I think uh, Moore is with them and Moore doesn't have a great history there either. You have to remember it's very misogynistic. They're very anti-female. Cassian is having to corral these people, make sure that they're training the women like they're supposed to be doing as Rhysand commanded. And you just get the sense that all of these guys there are just assholes, just assholes, treat women like shit, don't think that they're equal at all. And so Reese and Cassian have to spend a lot of time making sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, and Reese has um, put out a thing saying you can't clip the women's wings anymore. Anymore. (laughs) Some of them are still doing. And so Reese is not happy, but... That was something that Reese implemented, is you can't clip the women's wings. Yeah. It's just a very important cause to him because his mom was, you know, one of these women. And so in this time here, while Kazian and Asriel are making sure the camp is doing what it needs to be doing, Reese Ann's like, okay, I'm going to be training with you, Feyre, out in the woods because you are part of seven high lords. You need to tap into that magic and push it to the limits and see where it can go. So they go out to the woods. And talk to me about what happens there, because there's quite a bit, right? Yeah, so during one training session, they get attacked, and Lucian shows up. And Feyre tells him off and tells him to leave her the hell alone. Like, she is here of her own choice. And, like, I think she even, like, uses some of her magic against him. Uh Uh-huh. I think she scares Lucian in this Mm -hmm. moment because he sees her winnowing around behind him in and out. And I can't remember if she used any of her other power, like fire or ice or anything. But he's just like, okay, because I think he got glimpses of her power before whenever she was Mm -hmm. still with Tamlin. And so he's just kind of afraid is how he's looking at her now. And he still is just like, I'll take you back to Tamlin. Tamlin is not right. Like things have been really bad, like so much worse. Um, It just makes you wonder what's going on at Spring Court, you know, at this moment in time, because he's so worried and trying so desperately to get Feyre back there. Yeah. And then they stay a night at the inn and I will let you tell what happens at the (laughs) inn because we have some more sexy time and I I just, I don't know how I'm becoming the sexy time. (laughs) <laughs> and it's like okay the one bed trope people love the one bed trope it's like oh i requested two beds but they only gave us one bed and so i'm picturing like this little tiny you know closet basically with a slanted roof where you can't even stand up Rizan definitely can't stand up straight and they go in it's like the nastiest little hostel that you've ever seen in your life she doesn't even want to eat anything there bathe there and it's an eensy weensy little bed. And you have to remember, he has some big, big wings span. He's got a big wing span. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Which, and... as according to Feyre and their little banter back and forth, she has heard that the wing span is correlating to another <laughs> bodily appendage. <laughs> This was the conversation that they had flying to the Court of Nightmares, right? When they were yeah. kind of shot at the first time and he was so pissed off. It's like they were having like, oh, don't touch my wings. It's so sensitive there, like something else. <laughs> and it's just like that kind of scene. Well, and he got mad because he was distracted by that conversation that he didn't even notice people were shooting at him. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah. So yes, we have some more like, we had a little bit of the tension broke 
in the court of nightmares, but it's back full force for this staying at an inn adventure. They basically don't sleep at this inn. I mean, maybe she gets like an hour of sleep, but between being crammed, crammed up against him the entire night and them just fooling around, touching each other, you know, just getting some intimacy in that way, they don't sleep. And so they say, fuck having a bath because it's disgusting in this communal area. And so they decide to go. And But the conversation that they had that night was kind of strange because here's Resand who's been like, pouring out his heart, telling more of his history, his traumas and stuff. And then Feyre, meanwhile, is struggling with, oh, I feel like I'm still betraying Tamlin because it's only been a couple months. You know, we were engaged. I was going to marry him. What would he think? What would anyone think? And meanwhile, Rizan's like, that's going to be the story too. I'm going to be painted the villain too if we were to do anything now and act on anything. So they're both kind of struggling with this. But... So she makes a comment to the effect that, oh, let's just, you know, be physical and have fun for now. And Rhysand kind of interprets that as like, oh, she doesn't want anything more with me. If this is as good as it gets, I guess I'll take it, you know? And so he, the next morning, is completely preoccupied with these thoughts. And so again, that little foreshadowing from before is he's not paying attention to what's happening when he's flying with Feyre. And then what happens? They get attacked again. And again, arrows go through his wings and they're poisoned. And so he starts falling and he kind of like pushes her over to where where he falls is not where she falls. And she uses a little bit of her magic and like stops herself and then goes running after him. And she doesn't she like isn't this where she like beat like a bunch of them and killed them because she like put the arrows together and like Yes, these attackers had their shit together this time. They came prepared. They came with more creatures out there in the woods hunting them. They came with special chains that nullified his magic and healing. And not only did they use like the ash arrows, but they tipped them in some unknown poison. It turns out to be something called bloodbane, but she has no idea what it is because he's not healing. He's bleeding out. And so Feyre goes on like a taken kind of just killing she has a spree. special set of skills if you're looking for ransom i can tell you i don't have money but what i do have are a very particular set of skills <laughs> yes um, and she goes after it <laughs> and so she kills the people who who captured him and gets the chains off of him and then winnows him to this smaller little cave thing and he's still not healing by the morning so she gets her little cloak and goes and traps the cereal again to see if it will tell her what was that poison. Like, why is he not healing? And it does. It also gives her a little more information, which is that he is, in fact, her mate. And that he knew that she was his mate. And Feyre is big pissed. She is big mad that he kept that from her. Yes. Very, very, very. She's livid. Um, it's almost like a blind fury is how it came across, right? I'm this poor creature. It's like, oh, a cloak, a cloak, because it can't resist a nice cloak. And typically you would only ask a couple of questions and Feyre just has it hanging there and she's just asking it all of the questions and it's just like, what the hell put me down? <laughs> well, and it's the one that she, she trapped before and I uh-huh. think it felt sorry for her. Like, it wanted to give her these answers, so it's like, I'll let you trap me. Um, Because it felt like it owed her for saving its life before. And I don't know about you, but, like, I feel sorry for the surreal. Like, I know it's supposed to be this, like, gross creature, whatever. But, like, to me, it's like this little child who's like, I just want a cloak. It it was almost like, um, what is that little creature in, is it Harry Potter? Dobby? Dobby. Master has presented Dobby with clothes. Dobby is free. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Like, mm-hmm. like, I feel sorry for him. I, I'm like, I would take you home with me. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm that white girl that would, like, pet. I'm probably going to die from petting something that's not my friend. Um, <laughs> but, yes, I like him. And so she goes back and she she saves Reese because the, the cure 
for this is her blood. Like her blood can heal him. And then it'll be helped on by like these little flowers that the cereal told her where to get. And so she, she, even though she's pissed off, she gives him the little flower and like makes him drink her blood and then she gets him back home. And then she like pieces out. Like she's like more, I need you to take me somewhere else. She dumps his ass in the floor of the townhouse. Yes. And so then Moore takes her to this little, like, enchanted house that I want to live in. Like, the where cabin. people people find this house and tell me where it is. Because, like, I want a house that will feed me when I want and clean so I don't have to do it. And make my baths so I don't have to do it. Like, this sounds like heaven. And no one can find you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Warded, safe, definitely cozy vibes in that little snowy mountain cabin and Feyre has herself a little staycation really and Mm -hmm. just paints anything and everything I mean this house supplies her with whatever she's going to town just painting everywhere there's like a scene that they talk about all of the different things that she painted like Amryn's eyes over the bathroom door archway thing and they're just like why would you ever (laughs) paint that there and then more more's like put my eyes up there because I want to like I want Cassie and 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 as real to feel like we're staring at them when they're here <laughs> having their boys' nights. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Feyre does a lot of soul searching during this time. And I think she like calms herself down, which is important because that is growth for her. And then she realizes that, you know, that was probably Rizan's re- only move, really. Because if he would have done anything else, it would have seemed very selfish in a way. Like he was out to get something as a, as a goal mm-hmm. of his. And so after the fifth or sixth day of being in this cabin, she thinks more comes to the door. But who's there? Reese. And he is there to, like, get her back, basically. And so this is where we hear more about his story with Amarantha and why he is, like, his trauma response kicks in a lot. And he starts telling her that. And then he also told her that he, like, one of the things that kept him going is he saw in a dream or a vision or whatever, a hand and it was painting and it was like this good in the world when he is being basically tortured. And so he's like, that's what kept me going. And then he kept seeing like different like pieces of this. And then he finally saw this person in the spring court and he's like, wait, they're there. And then that's the night that he met Feyre at the... Um, Calame. Like, Calame. And um, Feyre was the one that he had been dreaming of. And the reason he was dreaming of her is she was his mate. And we also find out, like, she explains why painting was so important to her. And that she got that as a gift and that she painted something for everybody. And her thing that she painted was the night sky because it made her feel good or something. And that was a connection to him that she saw is the night sky. Basically chapter 54 of a court of mist and fury is the heart to heart. I am ripping my heart out and laying it bare and just showing it all to you about what I've been struggling with for all of this time. And then chapter 55 is like the The spice. This is the, the to use Tara's eloquent term from before, this is the fuck fest that happens where the, for almost, it's like 20 something pages is just Resand and Feyre accepting their mate bond. And they are just like, you cannot peel them apart. They are just like enmeshed. <laughs> but there's a little bit more to that story of how he found her too, which is that he followed her scent. And so, like, I'm going to call back to what I said in the first part where it, like, when he came to that table and, like, Lucian is hiding her, right? And I was like, it's like he smelled her. Mm -hmm. That is, in fact, what happened. And so he smelled her scent after meeting her that first night. And he's like, no, she's right over here. I know where she is. Um, And that is the reason he put the, not spell, but the bargain with her is he wanted a way to know that she was safe Mm -hmm. and be able to pull her back and let her like live a little bit. And so that to me, he was like meeting her where she was 
Mm -hmm. but also like love language out the ass there because he was willing to suffer just to make sure that she didn't. Yeah. He didn't want to force her or take away choice. Right. Because Mm -hmm. that's been so important to Feyre. She's never had a choice in anything before. Everything has been an obligation that falls on her shoulders or, you know, Tamlin controlling her. And Mm -hmm. so that was always something that was not going to be up for debate with him. I don't know if you got tickled at this part, but when she finds out that it's more and Amran, the women knew all along that they were mates and the guys didn't. I'm like, they, of course, they're so oblivious. They suspected, though. <laughs> they suspected. But it's like, of course, the women are first to know. And like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It just explains all of the weird, like, glances whenever pharaoh's first brought there you know and meets everyone and they're just like having silent conversations around pharaoh it's just so funny well and after they have their alone time she is glowing like full-blown glow not just like her skin's pretty no she is glowing and reese makes a smart ass comment about well at least i know that i can make you glow or something like that (laughs) And um, they also have, like, a children talk about, like, if they want children. He's like, well, I'd love children, but, like, I want you. So if that's not what you want, then, like, he is willing to give up pretty much anything he's ever wanted just to be with her. Tara's language, the sacrifice, and, yep, mm -hmm, Mm -hmm. mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This part cracks me up because then we go back to, like, where everybody else is. Mm -hmm. And everybody else knew exactly what was going on, right? Like, they all caught up at this point. And so we meet Cassian outside. And, like, Cassian starts a fight with Reese because he knows that he needs, like, to let loose. Because as Reese explained, most of the time, like, mates do not come out for a while. And even then, like, there's a territorial thing where, like, anybody says the wrong thing and all hell will break loose. And so Cassian's like, well, we don't want that to happen. So I'm going to piss him off so that he can like let loose a little bit of it. And so it doesn't just blow up. And so Cassian takes one for the team. <laughs> and, and, and what does he say? He says something like smart ass about like, if you ever get tired or whatever. Like, I'm around for a ride or something like yes, that. Yeah. Yes. Just something very blunt and recent is not happy. <laughs> not having it. Um, and so they get into a little bout and she's like, she just goes on it and kind of like, okay, you guys have fun. And so then she talks to like Amron and more and they're like, welcome to the family. Finally. Mm-hmm. Going back a little bit, didn't you think the soup scene was so cute too? Because mm-hmm. Feyre doesn't know what she's doing. She just starts fixing a pot of like canned soup. And he's just like, wait, 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 before you do that, just know, you know, for the mate bond to be accepted, it's typically, you know, traditional that the female makes the male food to show that she accepts the bond. And so while he's like sharing his heart out, she's just like listening and then like, at the end of it serves him the soup and he's just like looking at her like really (laughs) it's like it's canned soup but it's so cute oh it was so sweet Mm -hmm. i just these two chapters was just like everything and then we get to back to the mortal queens Mm -hmm. because now that they have the orb of veritas and all of this now they go meet with the mortal queens to show valaris exists but not all of the queens show up it's just two of them Mm mm-hmm The Gold Queen and the Ancient One. And um, it's a very weird, alarming kind of conversation because they do show Valaris and the queens do seem like they are astounded and in disbelief that Rhysand was able to keep this from Amarantha. But the Ancient Queen is still like, hell no, we're not giving the book to you. And so they leave. And so the letter that he wrote to them wasn't necessarily asking them for their help, but it was a love letter to Feyre um, saying like, I want a world where the woman I love can feel safe and her sisters can feel safe. And it was basically all about like that world that he wants and what he has to do to get there. And Oh, Reese is just winning my heart. I know he's like, 
So perfect. Um, so perfect. And so the the ancient queen is a drag and she's like, hell no, we're not giving or well, she didn't say hell no. She said like we'll think about it. And everybody else is like, we know what that means. Even Nesta's like, you've already decided. Like she goes full like Nesta. Nesta, and, you gotta love that about Nesta for yes, feistiness. Yes. Mm-hmm. And um, so they get up to leave and everybody's arguing with them except for Reese. And then we find that the gold queen had left the book and she left a note saying, you know, I too want this world where everybody can feel safe. And she left it. And Reese had picked up that she was leaving it. And that's why he was like, no, just let him leave. Go before the ancient one realizes that that was what's happening. And um, so they get the book and they go back to Valaris. The golden queen also left a warning. She's like, something mm-hmm. is not right. Uh, mm-hmm. Like they're With the queens, something. like the, mm-hmm. the sixth one was not sick. Something is wrong. Yeah. So they take the book back, give it to Amran to try and decipher, right? Uh-huh. And then the next day, Valaris is attacked. And it is quite the invasion. The mortal queens had sold them out. And isn't the golden queen, her body dumped mm-hmm. out of the sky? And she's uh-huh. like still dying, like in her last yeah. twitches. She was like whatever. impaled or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They had gouged out her eyes or something too. Like it was uh-huh. creepy. It was bad. Um, um, Feyre goes just full. She's like doing everything. She is super creative. It's almost like her painting background helps her be more imaginative yeah. with her fighting, right? Yeah, because she created the wolves out of the water. And it's like basically having the wolves drown people. Mm-hmm. She's drowning them. She's freezing them in the sky and they're dropping and shattering. She's winnowing all over the place. I mean, she is doing a lot. Um, and then she goes after the adder as well, like just goes solo motion, shuts Reesand out because he's essentially freaking out, not wanting anything to happen to her. He's still in like hyper possession, you know, mm-hmm. kind of possessive mode with the mate bond and everything, very sensitive. Um, but it's just like death and carnage happening all over Valaris. And you know that he's going to feel bad after all of it because it was his idea <laughs> to show them. She got a bad feeling when they were about to show him. She was like, we shouldn't do this. We shouldn't do this. Like, something's going to happen. Don't do this. And he's like, well, this is our only shot at having this world that I I want. And um, we also see Amran, like, laying them out, too. And later on, we find out that she was, to some of them, she was, like, basically making their fears kill them. Like, making them so afraid that their heart stops, which would not be a fun way to die. And then what was she doing to the others? She was doing something else to some of them. I don't know. She has fire. Um, that fear got me. I was like, yeah, Whoa. she can do yeah. just so much. Then after this, they're like, you know what? We're going to take the fight to him. And so they plan to go to Highburn. They do plan to go to Highburn like the next day because they don't want to wait any longer. And I think Amran does. She like puts it together. She's like, okay, this is what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to join the pieces and say this phrase, you know, in a different language. Well, she language. said not to join the pieces. Or she Is that what she said? Yeah. Oh, okay. So she said, don't join the pieces, but this is the phrase. Okay. But the night before that they go to Highburn, they do stay at, is it, um, where do they stay? Oh. They stay at the townhouse, and this is when Rhysand and Feyre decide, are we going to stay in your room, my room, keep separate rooms? Like, what are we doing? And Feyre's like, we'll take your room. You have a bigger bed. And there's, like, a little story that he shares. You want to talk about it? (laughs) So he pulls out the ring that she got back from the weaver. And she's like, so I stole my own engagement ring? And he's like, (laughs) well, yes. Um, but his mother gave it to him when he was little as like a sign of like, like you're loved basically. And, um, she took it back when he was an adult and she basically told him that it was meant for the person that he marries, his mate, and that they, in order to be his mate and to survive being his mate, they would need to be smart enough to get it back from the weaver which is where she took it for safekeeping. So basically it was, you know, 
Feyre proving herself to be good enough for Rhysand. Or that she could handle him. All of Rhysand's little strategies and his games and his little, you know, obtuse requests and quests that he has her going on. It's all for a reason. He's basically the Aelin of this book. <laughs> yes. He's like uh-huh. 10 steps ahead of everybody else. Yes. And they they also do something this night that we'll touch back on after we finish the rest of what goes on. So they do end up going to Highburn, and it's like the biggest like stealth mission ever. You know, everyone's all in doing this. They're flying low because Highburn is off on its own little continent island, you know, whatever you want to call it. And this place is warded. It has all kinds of security alarms built in, and they have to sneak in to get to the cauldron is what they're after. And so what's what's going on over here? So they all get in and they make it to the cauldron like they find it. And then Jurian steps out, right? And he's like, oh, so you guys made it. Like, this wasn't that hard for us. Like, welcome, I guess. And they find out that their powers have been shut off by the king. And then out steps Lucian and Tamlin. And they are in league with the king. And basically their part of it is that they would bring the night court to them in exchange for Feyre. And, but the king has kind of went behind their backs a little bit in working with Ianthe. And Ianthe told them about Feyre's sisters. And so the king also has Feyre's sisters. And he is using that to prove to the queens that he can make them like mortal, fey, immortal, immortal. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Faye. It's a whole people, like a whole bunch of people are gathered here. And as has been shot with an arrow, and so he's kind of out of commission now. No one can use their power. With the poison. Yes, with the poison. Like, very bad shape. Cassian's wings are shredded to pieces, and he's bleeding out. Everyone is freaking out. Elaine and Nesta are there. Elaine is a total basket case, just like screaming and crying. And the queens are all there because the one thing the mortal queens want is immortality in a way, just to become high fae. But they're wanting proof that it's not going to do anything sinister and bad with them. So the king has Elaine go into the cauldron first. Like it's this old ancient magic kind of tub. It fills up with black water the king of highburn's eyes are black and they have elaine get dunked into this water the whole time and she comes out and you want to talk about the next things that happen so she comes out as a fae and then nesta has to go in and nesta goes in fighting she's like spitting and they say that she it says that she makes a gesture with one finger and i'm imagining she points at the king and it says, Oh, okay. You. I was imagining a different gesture. No, she was uh, like, you. <laughs> she comes out and Feyre immediately feels something's different about her. Like the cauldron gave up too much to her. And so Nesta's already feisty, but if she got too much from the cauldron, like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of feeling sorry for the king at this point because (laughs) she is going to, like, they're going to make him pay. But anyway, she runs to Elaine and Elaine is still on the ground and Lucian is being very, like, protective of her. And Nesta's like, you better get the fuck away. And, like, we find out that Lucian is Elaine's mate and he doesn't want to get the kid away. And Nesta's like, you better go. You better leave. (laughs) And then we see that, like, all hell's going to break loose because Feyre's mad that he did this to her sisters. And so Feyre pretends that she was able to break free of Reese's, like, hold on her mind. And she's like, who, who, what, where? (gasps) Tamlin! You saved me! Yes, (laughs) and you saved me. And so that she can leave with Tamlin, right? And... She's like, I'll leave with you, but, like, nobody else dies. I don't want any other death happening, right? And when she was pretending that she broke her hold, or Reese's hold on her, she, in fact, brought down all of the, like, spells that were keeping everybody in. So now they can winnow out, 
And so she's like, just no more death. And she's like, secretly telling Reese, take my, take my sisters, go take my sisters and go. And so Reese is like, okay, fine. So he winnows out with her sisters and Moore and Cassian and Asriel winner winnow out too. And then she leaves with Tamlin. And um, more and like when they get back, Amron's like, where is she? Where is she? And Reese is like, she she went with Tamlin. And they're all like, what the fuck just happened? And he's like, oh, it's OK. Like, she's my spy now. And they're like, wait, he broke your bond, though. And he's like, no, he just broke the bargain. We still have our bond. Her other like, arm. Yeah, her other arm. So. When, when he broke that, he made her, like, took her glove off and she still had the tattoo, or she didn't have the tattoo from the bargain, right? And, um, however, on her other arm, she had another tattoo, which is that the night before, they got married and she was sworn in as the high lady of the night court. And so now Moore's even madder because she's like, wait, you sent my high lady over there? And he's like, your high lady chose to go. Chill. She's fine. And so now, like Tamlin was trying to get her to do for him, she is a spy in another court. We got a mole over in the spring court. <laughs> her name is Vera. And Lucian is losing his shit because Elaine, his mate, is now in the night court. And like, who was it? Jurian who's like, oh, you know what they do to like women over there. Pass them around. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Lucian also is very suspicious of Feyre. He thinks something's off, but he doesn't want to say anything because he's beholden to Feyre being Elaine's sister. So he knows something is off. Something smells bad about this situation. Well, that, and I think he also doesn't want to say anything without any proof to Tamlin because Tamlin is so besotted that I think he's afraid he's going to get in trouble too. Yes. Like he's going to get in trouble with both of them. If he is right... And he just, like, got Feyre in trouble. She's going to be mad, and that's his, his mate's sister. But if he's wrong, then Tamlin's going to be mad at him. So he wins nothing by, by bringing it up. You see a whole lot of mindfuckery going on at the end of this book because, you know, meanwhile, while Feyre's holding Tamlin's hand and his arm walking through the garden, she's looking over her shoulder and, like, smirking at Lucian and stuff like that. And you're like... In the next book, it's going to be utter chaos. You're like, what in the hell? And the fact that Elaine was engaged to a mortal who hated Faye, and you have to believe that she kind of got indoctrinated to that belief as well, too. So <laughs> if Lucian has any hope of being Elaine's mate, like accepted, it's going to be a very uphill battle. It's going to be very interesting. Well, that and her sister already hates him. Uh, yeah, because he just did nothing for Feyre ever, just like stood on the sidelines. Well, and like, I mean, Elaine is the one who was more like welcoming of Feyre. And so sisterly bond wise, I think that they have a closer one than yes. her and Nesta. Although Nesta is now pissed the fuck off. Didn't so. they call Nesta like a hellcat or something? Uh -huh. She was basically like a hellcat clawing and snapping and yeah 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 the king did because he's like okay the pretty one first which is elaine and then after elaine came out he's like okay now the hellcat <laughs> and it that scene was just so so good cannot wait to get to the next book next books i should say uh, is there any other things that we need to talk about with this there was just so much in the second half i mean the whole book was just Full of stuff, whether it was romantic tension or action or more world lore being dumped on you, but like so many moving pieces coming to play, like finally paying off that were hinted at in the first book. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, any um, any theories about what's going to go on with the big bad or anything like that? Well, I knew in this one because when they got to the cauldron, I was like, there's no way this is going to go without a hitch because there's what, three other books? Like, there's no way it's over, like with this one. But Jurian did ask more where Miriam is in the last, like, little bit of the scene. 
And she's like, oh, she's dead. And he's like, yeah, I know you're lying. You're a liar. And Az is like, mm. <laughs> which I thought was funny. Because he's like Poor dying ass. on the floor. But he's still like, don't call her a liar. And they had also mentioned, like, maybe we'll have to bring Miriam back. And Moore was like, no. So I have a feeling we're going to bring Miriam back. Because, like, I feel like she and Draken are going to play a part in this. And the fact that his name's Draken, like, is he a dragon? Because, like, that's what that means, isn't it? Like, like, is that why he was so needed in the first war? Like, is he something special? Like, I think he's something special. Like, Who knows? So, like, we have bats. <laughs> like, we could have a dragon. But yes. So I have a feeling there's something there. It's going to be a lot. Of, there's a lot of wounds going on. Resan's still healing, as is her. Cassian is... You know, he's not doing so hot. This is going to be a lot of things. And besides just the physical aspect changing a little bit for Nesta and um, Elaine, because I think it said like their features kind of got elongated and their kind of skin and hair changed a little bit, their eyes. But besides that, we don't know how else any change is going to be manifested. Oh, I think that there's going to be some major changes with Nesta. (laughs) We shall see. She's going to be like Manon badass or like Sandra so? badass. Yeah, I, I do love Sarah J. Mass makes some female characters very, very, very empowering. Yes, always. Like, I love that. It's not just the men who like are kick ass. It's the women, too. I mm-hmm. love that about it. Mm-hmm. There's no simpering little like, oh, my God, somebody has to save me. Well, we're going to see. So. We hope that you enjoyed this episode covering the last half of A Court of Mist and Fury by Sarah J. Mass. If you missed it, we covered book one in Akatar the previous uh, two, two weeks ago. Um, we covered that one. So next Monday, we're going to dive into the first half of A Court of Wings and Ruin. So book three of Akatar. So... We hope you enjoyed this episode. Definitely give us a like and subscribe. Um, If you're listening to the podcast, you can always leave a rating or review if you have some extra time. And we are so happy that you tuned in. So thank you. And we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye.